Hey, so it's been a very busy summer. Uh, I haven't posted a video in a while. Uh, it's I've been doing a lot of things. One of the things I've been doing uh, is traveling, and last month I was in Chicago for an educator summit, and I was asked to give a talk on how to think like a mathematician, uh, which was a real surprise to me, but also a real delight. Uh, I've never, and an honor, I'd, I'd never been asked to, to give a talk before, especially not to so many people. So it was quite an experience, and I'm thankful for that opportunity. Here's the video. Uh, it's about the full talk is about 45 minutes long. Here's the first half of it. If you'd like to watch the whole thing, check out the link in the description. And I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks all for being here. Uh, I I, I'll, I just want to begin by uh, by by thanking Turning Point and. Uh, Jen Burns in particular for inviting me. Um, I teach primarily online, uh, so I've, for the past 10 years I've been talking to a camera, so this is a real pleasure for me to actually be able to see faces. <clears throat> so um, uh, I'd like to begin with an observation, um, because I have experience teaching both mathematics and literature at, at various levels. and. Uh, this is a commonplace, but mathematics we know to be eminently useful, and it's especially valued today, uh, perhaps more than it's ever been valued in history. And we have all this emphasis on STEM subjects, right, even STEAM subjects, uh, and we're really pushing students sort of as, as a culture toward these subjects, toward these degrees, toward these careers. And what I've noticed is that inside the classroom, um, things are a little bit different in the sense that students don't seem to value these things the same way that everyone else does outside the classroom. Uh, for instance, um, and those of you who teach math might, might relate to this, you get the question, when will I ever use this? Right? When, when do I need to know, when am I going to need to know uh, what a tangent ratio is? How is this going to help me in my adult life? And the problem is that most of the time, unless your students are headed towards some kind of uh, engineering career, the answer is it's not, right? You're never going to use this again. So then the question remains, well, what are we doing? <clears throat> so what happens then is that because of the way that we, that we tend to, to, to teach math and a few other things that I'll talk about, mathematics for a lot of students remains personally irrelevant and not useful to their lives. Um, on the other hand, in the literature classroom, uh, I find things to be a little bit different. And it's very possible that maybe I just have particularly literary students, uh, but I find that literature doesn't need a defense in the same kind of way inside the classroom as, as math does. And so I, and I think that this points to a, toward a general truth uh, which may not be immediately apparent when you're just comparing literature and math. And so even though students will protest individual books, um, because everybody has books that they don't like, what doesn't happen is I, I, I don't have students telling me that Dante or Shakespeare or Dostoevsky is irrelevant to their lives. Right? They may hate Dostoevsky, but I, I don't get the complaint that he's irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> So then the question is, why not? What's happening? And so this is what, what I think some of the difference is. Um, literature connects with students in a way that math tends not to for several reasons. Well, first, it speaks into their lives, right? It gives them categories for understanding others and themselves. Uh, and human, as human beings, we find meaning in a story. <clears throat> Without a story, there is no meaning. All you have is fact. And so story connects events and facts into a temporal and cohesive whole in which the relationships of the parts matter. And it's from these relationships that meaning emerges. And so for that reason, literature has no need to prove itself because it's dealing with the very things that give 
meaning to various aspects of our lives. But when we teach math, we don't allow math to have a story of its own. And so it feels disconnected from students' lives and from the things that matter to them. And so I think we can do better. So uh, let's see. So uh, this is, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be summarizing some things that have already been said by um, the, all the other wonderful speakers. Uh, so you have to bear with me here. And I promise that this is relevant. I know that this is a talk on math, and so far I've been talking about literature, and I'm about to talk about history. But I promise that this all ties in somehow. Uh, so I'd like to take you on uh, a brief history, something like um, an, an analysis of our ideological heritage or ancestry to show you how we've gotten to where we are. And I think this is relevant uh, no matter the subject that we're teaching um, because it, it gives us a position from which to analyze some of the assumptions that we bring to education. And because they're assumptions, we, just, we, we don't think about them. Right? We simply assume them. So part of what I'm doing is I'm trying to give us that opportunity to, stay, to take a step back and analyze some of the ways that we, that we, that we think. So, uh, I'll, oh, by the way, I'll also just say, I'm not a historian, so I know some of you are, so I'm apologizing in advance. These are broad characterizations, uh, and anytime you give, uh, make really general statements, there's a sense in which they're all false. So with that caveat out of the way, uh, I'd like to take you to the Middle Ages. So in the Middle Ages, as we heard earlier, um, theology was the queen of the sciences, right? And science here just means body of knowledge. So theology was the queen of the sciences, and philosophy was the handmaiden to theology. It was in, to serve in the interests of theology, also like we heard earlier, right? And so reason, and I'm, I'm using reason and philosophy more or less interchangeably, um, as you know, re philosophy deals with, with, with reasonable thought. Uh, so reason was subservient to theology, right? It, was, it supported theology. It was defended by theology as well. And it was understood to be a tool to serve in the interests of theology. So re the reason then was also understood to be a gift from God, right? Not only to be a general tool, but also as a way of coming to know him. Now, once we get to the Enlightenment, uh, things are a little bit different, right? Time has passed. And one of the things that emerges in the Enlightenment is you have this inversion now of the medieval hierarchy of theology and philosophy. And so now philosophy becomes perhaps, uh, for lack of a better term, queen of the sciences, and theology is somewhere further down the list. And if you want an example of this, you can think about the way Thomas Jefferson treated the Bible, right? You might remember that he takes his New Testament, attacks it with a razor blade, and cuts out all the different passages he likes while leaving all the passages he doesn't, right? And pastes all the new ones in a little book. And so it, what, what he was doing was he was trying to make Scripture more palatable. And he does this by the removal of the miraculous, right? So to such thinkers, then, what reason is, is it, it's a way of conquering nature. And you also see this reflected in the writings of Bacon, or maybe Bacon's looking forward to this. Um, but reason, then, is, is, a, is a way to conquer nature, and it's a way of understanding ourselves and humanity. And so... Rather than um, taking our cues from Scripture, from God, instead what we have is uh, nature and reason together giving us these things. The next thing I have is perhaps a little surprising, um, and I'll explain why. This might also be the most valuable point in my talk, by the way, and nothing to do with, it, with math. Um, but Darwin, Darwin profoundly influenced human thought in ways that a lot of people don't, don't realize. Um, and I think the first person to notice this actually was John Dewey, and we've heard some about him earlier as well. So John Dewey, even though he had lots of bad ideas for education, he was extremely perceptive on this one point. And in an essay he wrote in 1910 called The Influence of Darwinism on Philosophy, which you can look up. If you just look up uh, John Dewey, Darwin, Philosophy, you'll find this essay. It's not super long, 20 pages. 
Um, he explains that what Darwin did, which nobody was talking about at the time, was Darwin destroyed nature. That's what Darwin did. <clears throat> and the way that this works, it, well, I have to sort of explain. Okay, so, so nature, what I mean by nature is not like birds and plants and trees and stuff, obviously, right? Instead, what we mean by nature is something, it's it, nature in the sense of human nature. Nature in the sense of, it's in the nature of the acorn to grow into an oak tree. Nature in that sense. And so it's nature in the sense of nature being this, this thing in objects, in beings, um, that's like a motive force possessing a teleology. All right, so it's moving towards some predetermined end. And what I mean by this is if you have an acorn and you plant the acorn and you give it all the right circumstances, so it's got you know, the right kind of soil, it's got light, it's got water, it's natural right, for the, for the acorn to turn into an oak tree. That's the natural progression. It would be unnatural to get a tomato plant. right? So what Darwin does is he severs that because now... After Darwin, we're living in a world where, given enough time and enough generations, maybe an acorn could turn into something else, right? So that's the sense in which Darwin destroys nature. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because the other thing Darwin does is he destroys the, philos okay, so, so the philosophical certainty, right, that an acorn will turn into an oak tree or that a puppy will turn into an adult dog, any of these things. So that's the first thing. The second thing he destroys is human nature. Because if you can't, if you don't have nature, well, neither do you have human nature. And by human nature, I just mean um, the sense in which human, there are certain things which are, which are good for human beings, right? Humans have a nature, we, we, uh, we grow, there are certain things which are proper to humans, right? That's what he destroys. <laughs> And because he destroys human nature, he also consequently destroys the imperatives of the natural law. Because if you don't have nature, you can't have human nature, nor can you have natural law. Now, um, the, the thing with this is it took a long time for people to realize this. I mean, Dewey's writing in 1910. This is many decades after Darwin published his work. And when Darwin first published, everyone was really concerned with the theological implications of his work, right? So you have all kinds of clergymen writing against Darwin. And meanwhile, one of the, I don't know, I don't want to say that this is a more important impact, uh, but it's certainly up there with the theological implications of, of Darwin. You have this entering into people's way of thinking and they didn't even realize. <laughs> So it took generations then for the impact of Darwin's thinking to really be felt. But what happened, right, was that it began to erode conceptions of human goodness, perfection, purpose, began to erode notions of evil, as well as the idea of truth. Now, what I mean by saying that it began to erode the idea of truth is that um, before Darwin and before all this, we had a broader understanding of the true. After Darwin, things get narrowed into uh, what we typically think of today as like scientific truth or something, right? Just to give you an example of this, um, it used to be commonplace that an action could be true or false. Not just words, but actions could be true or false. Right? I mean, you see this reflected in Scripture even where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. A person could be truth. Right? And so what's happened is we've actually narrowed the definition of truth to a single thing, which today is basically like propositional truth or, um, or scientific truth, right? Where we're just comparing statements to reality in a very simple and primitive way. So as truth then begins to erode, the natural sciences, as well as math, get elevated, right? Because now this is the place where we still can talk about things being true, and we can still evaluate things. And so then these things become sources of ultimate truth. And scientific proof becomes the standard then for truth and for belief. 
Now, the erosion of truth then um, leads, well, it leads somewhere, and it leads to Nietzsche. <laughs> and I'll explain how, how we get there in a second. So, as truth begins to erode, well, of course, it takes down with it, you know, goodness and evil. And Nietzsche, in his book, Beyond Good and Evil, uh, and again, I'm simplifying tremendously, but he essentially argues that what lies beyond good and evil, once you get past moralizing and thinking in moral categories, the thing that lies beyond is power. That's it, right? Just, just, just power. And today we're living in the dark reality of Nietzsche's vision, <clears throat> in which uh, truth is largely just a political tool, right? And so truth is hidden, it's skewed, it's misrepresented, it's embellished for political ends. And this is true regardless of which side of the political aisle you're on. Everyone is abusing truth, just using it to get ahead. And we're guilty of this as well, even as teachers. And the way that we're guilty of this leads me now to my last point, pragmatism. And I'm, I'm not using this in any kind of technical sense. Um, I'm just using it as a shorthand for, like, um, well, pragmatism. <laughs> so we have a set of assumptions, right, which is part of the exercise of doing this, just to look at our assumptions. Um, and these assumptions, I think, are really unhelpful. So I'm gonna lay them out for you, and I think that you'll see that these are just common places today. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to point them out. So here's the first one. That science is valuable because it produces technologies that give us power. It's not a remarkable statement. Science is valuable because it produces technologies that grant us power. Um, Okay, so, that, so that's the first one. Let's, let, let's take it as, as a premise. Let's add a second one to it, second premise. Math is valuable because it has scientific and other applications. I think that's relatively commonplace as well, right? So this brings us to a conclusion. Math is valuable because it gives us power. Is this really what we want to teach students? that uh, good and evil are inconsequential in the search for power? Because that's where this thinking leads, right? I mean, we would never purposely say this, uh, but we imply this when we defend math by appealing only to its utility, right? And so when we defend math by appealing only to its utility, we imply that education has no intrinsic value or meaning. We imply that things are useful only if they bring us material or social benefit. And we also perpetuate the lie that we've heard so many times before, that education is only for employment, right? It exists to get, to get you a job. That work is a necessary evil in the pursuit of retirement, right? Work was actually given to us by God, it's a good thing. And then finally, that one retires to enjoy a few years of life before one dies. Hooray! <laughs> right? And we wonder why so many students are so depressed and unmotivated, right? So there's a better way to defend mathematics. So I'd like to give you then what I consider, um, whoop, it's working. Oh, there we go. Um, I'd like to give you what I consider a, uh, a non-pragmatic defense of math. I've got three points here. So the first one is that math is fundamentally about beauty. Secondly, um, math teaches us about the structure of our own minds. It's an, it's an investigation into rationality itself. And then finally, math describes the universe as it's, as it's created by God. And I'll go through each one of these. So math is about beauty. <clears throat> so, well, this begs the question, well, then what is beauty about? Well, beauty is fundamentally about relationship. Right? I mean, one, one simple way of explaining this is to say that it has something to do with ratio and proportion. So if you think about painting, 
If you think about architecture, if you think about sculpture or music, all of these are very concerned with these kinds of relationships, right? Ratio, proportion, the arrangement of figures. I mean, the, the Greeks were obsessed with this, right? Where you have all of these ancient sculptors who were obsessing over trying to find the ideal proportions to represent the human body. I mean, they understood that there was a connection here between beauty and ratio and proportion. I mean, even something like poetry, well, we can't really apply ratio and proportion to poetry directly, but we have analogous concepts like meter and rhyme, right? There are also others uh, regarding, you know, sonic, re sonic relationships and whatnot, not like um, alliteration is one of them. Even metaphor. Metaphor is a relationship, right, where you're comparing two things. And it's in these things in which beauty is either found or lost. So math is beautiful then because it concerns itself with defining the relationship between ideas.